Hello everyone, thank you for joining me again today. My name is Michael and I'm the minister at Hay Presbyterian Church in Christchurch and I'm continuing with the Salt Shaker series today. This series has considered the church, both the universal church and the local church, from many different angles. We've looked at theology and ecclesiology, which is the practice of sort of how we do church and what it means to be the church. We are God's gathered community and we are participants in a cosmic plan for redemption. Today though the focus is very practical. I want to look at hospitality. Being hospitable means extending a welcome to travellers or offering a home away from home. Sounds pretty simple, pretty practical stuff, but when we delve a bit deeper we see it's also a central theme of all scripture. To start though with the two readings that I've chosen. The first one is from Leviticus chapter 19 verses 30 to 34 and I'm reading from the NIV. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Stand up in the presence of the aged Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And the second reading uh, from the New Testament is from Acts chapter 28 verses 11 to 16, <clears throat> Paul's arrival in Rome. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of twin gods, Castor and Pollu. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived in Reagan. The next day, the south wind came up and on the following day, we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they travelled as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. God creates the universe and a special place for Adam and Eve to live in the Garden of Eden. They have everything they need to thrive in created joy. The creative work of God in making a home for his most prized creation, that's human beings, is a demonstration of hospitality and reflective of God's character. So the creation demonstrates God's hospitality. Secondly, our showing, our showing hospitality reflects and extends God's hospitality. And when we show hospitality, it's an extension of God's nature. We don't usually think of hospitality in those terms, but I think we should start to see it as actually, yep, showing God's love for others. Thirdly, hospitality is expressed in the biblical proclamation of the relationship between God and his people. All through scripture, God continues to provide for his people. For example, in the Exodus, leading his people out of Egypt and out of their, uh, their oppression. The coming of the, or the giving of the revealing of the covenant and the entering of the promised land, etc. are all examples of the continuing provision of Jehovah Jireh, God, providing for his people, showing hospitality to them in a divine way. Later in the New Testament, the provision of salvation for Jew and Gentile in Christ is an extension and further example of God's hospitality. So we see this theme running right through scripture. Hospitality was commanded for God's people. 
Israel was to welcome foreigners and strangers in the land, as we saw in that Leviticus reading. It was one among many laws given to the Israelites, including not consulting spiritists and mediums and respecting the elderly. Hospitality was key because God had demonstrated his love to his people when they were oppressed in Egypt and they were told not to forget that. And the church too is to remember uh, God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ and live generously including showing hospitality. When we think of hospitality, food is what comes to mind most obviously and quite understandably. But hospitality is also broader than that. It's looking out for others. It's empathising. It's being an active listener to people when they share, as well as in some instances providing lodging. These are all aspects of what it means to be hospi hospitable. Hospitality includes all these things and sometimes they flow together. When you think about it, being together around food breaks down barriers and inhibitions. We sit on the same level around a common table and we eat the same things and from this conversation flows, uh, conversation flows very naturally. Food just has that effect. There's much going on in these exchanges when we sit together and we eat. And when you think about it, it's these, these situations that make us truly human. God's fellowship with us and ours with each other is so important in our growth towards maturity, both as human beings and emotionally and, of course, spiritually. The church has to do hospitality well, even if that jars with a culture that we live in which prizes independence over interdependence. At a deeper level, we are actually hardwired, made in God's image for relationship and connecting with others. And sharing is how God wants us to live. It's significant in combating many ills affecting people in our society today. Loneliness, depression, anxiety and other mental health issues. I believe if we had more genuine connection, a lot of those issues would be reduced in their effect. We share our lives together and we grow, but isolation can create a seedbed of despair. So here's what sharing food does. These are just a few things. Sharing food reflects the provision of a generous God. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Sharing food is a natural context for sharing life exper life's experiences together. Sharing food allows for different levels of interaction. We can have general and quite superficial conversation over food, that's fine. We can share personal and significant issues in our lives, or over food can also, can also be very formal uh, as well as informal. So there's different levels of interaction that are possible around food. Food, of course, nourishes the body, but it does more than that. It nourishes our soul when we share it with others. Sharing food can be a surprise and a blessing when it's unsolicited. And I'm sure we can all think of people who have just gone the extra step to not only inquire how we are, but when we have a need, uh, people, some people may arrive with a meal on our doorstep. You know, those things are really very special. Um, sharing food can be evangelistic. It's not just we think of evangelism. We might think of handing out tracts or going to a big meeting. Um, but evangelism is actually, it, it can be those things. But just being real people and living and generosity and thoughtfulness towards others is actually evangelistic in a sense. It is sharing the good news of Jesus in very practical ways. And sharing food, as we all know, is simply among life's pleasures. This is a map 
of Paul's journey to Rome, which was the capital of the empire. This is following his three missionary journeys and his, his last trip before captivity and imprisonment in Rome for two years. By this time, he had been beaten and shipwrecked. He was pretty battle-hardened. For his sea journey, the Alexandrian ship was like this one. And note in verse 11 of the Acts passage that it had two carved idols on its figurehead. I'll come back to that in a moment. In a moment. But we can see on the map here, on the left-hand side, uh, the sea journey from Malta to Syracuse, and then across to the mainland, uh, up to Puteoli, and then uh, on foot up to Rome. On Malta, poor Paul saw healings and was honoured among the people there. It is said that those on Malta, and I'm reading from chapter 28, verse 10, which is just before our reading, it says in the NIV, uh, Paul, uh, we were on, we were honoured in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they, the people there, furnished us with the supplies that we needed. So they were honoured. Paul's party was honoured in many ways. They were looked out for in regards to their welfare and comfort, and they showed care and respect. This is the local people showing these things to Paul and his group, and they furnished us. It said. With the supplies that we needed so food and other provisions were provided in other words on their journey Paul and his group experienced hospitality the ship as I mentioned a moment ago had carved images on the front these were the twin brothers they were called of Castor and Pollo the sons of the Greek god Zeus so we see this picture of the ship here on the very front uh, there would have been those images and it's really interesting because and quite symbolic because not even profane idolatry could stop God's plans we see that too in the book of Judges by the way terrible time in Israel's history uh, when idolatry was rampant and God's people were in real disarray but even through all of that God raised up judges notable individuals some of them were notable some of them weren't some of them were very ordinary people but God moved in spite of the idolatry of the people and we see another example of it here it says in verse 14 they found brethren and so went on land so <laughs> those two letters there so so in other words the love and acceptance and attention of the Christians at Puteoli gave Paul and Luke what they needed to send them where God wanted them to go. And in our churches, you know, there may be some people who will move away. There always are. We live in a very transient time in history when people are very mobile and on the move. And it's true in our churches too. Some people sitting in our churches may be here for just a short time to be ministered to in this particular body and they're being equipped and revived in order to serve somewhere else and as a parish minister of course we want and need people to stay in our particular fellowship but at the same time we need to hold people lightly and when you think about it all of us are passing through we're all passing through this life we are all transient in one sense verse 15 says the brethren came to meet them where they were when the church is being the church of the scriptures its members will leave their comfort zones to meet the needs of others we perhaps call these people extra milers and we know what that means i have to say there have been some people in my life who have met me as it were at the forum of appius and the three taverns people who turn up at the right time and just God uses them powerfully to minister and people listening may also know special people can look back on their lives and say yep I can see the hand of God in that particular person who did this or did that and really helped me at a point of need the local church needs to be a place I believe of exceptional welcome 
The local church needs to be a place of abundant generosity. The local church needs to be a place of full participation in the care of souls. Imagine being a new person here at this church or any other church for that matter. Or perhaps you can recall the first time you attended your church. What stood out? Were others genuinely welcoming? Did anyone inquire if you had needs? Are our churches genuinely welcoming places? I'd like to think so. And I think at Hoon Hay we do some things very well. But of course there's always room for more. Um, we need to avoid what's called the bystander effect. Um, where we can think, we can just stand by and let others do things and say to ourselves, oh, look at someone else's job. But actually, the local ecclesia, the church as God wants it to be, has full participation. And when it comes to hospitality, there really is room for everybody. We cannot say, oh, look, that's just someone else's job. When, when it comes to hospitality, we can all have a part to play in welcoming others, and particularly new people. So the key with hospitality, here it is, I think. We know this is sometimes called the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I think if we have that as a cornerstone for hospitality, we're actually in the right place. Or perhaps expressed another way, put ourselves in the shoes of a new person or visitor. What is it that makes them feel welcome and wanting to return? Well, to answer my own question, I think it really is the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all those other character virtues that Paul talks about that come from not just the human spirit, but the Holy Spirit working in and through us. When our churches are full of people who live like that, they are attractive places. It's been said... Uh, there's no second chance to make a first impression. Churches can be very welcoming. Um, we've got to be careful there. We don't want to go over the top and come across as patronising or condescending. But we need to real. I think every church fellowship needs to think through how it handles hospitality and welcome and put ourselves in the shoes of a person who hasn't been there before. Because if we're part of a fellowship for any length of time. We know how things operate. We know the patterns and the rhythms. But what about somebody who may have no knowledge of that? They are what the scriptures would call perhaps a foreigner or a stranger coming into our midst. And it's really important how we treat them. When the local church is a haven of hospitality, it is being the church as God intended. It's a safe harbour for weary souls. Its diverse personalities and gifts equip it to meet every need in some way. And in a truly mysterious way, God is present among all the human interaction and endeavour. When our churches are like this, they are attractive places. They are an antidote to the world's chaos and confusion. And perhaps more importantly, even than all those things, they are issuing from the love of Christ, as shown in this, this is called a wordle diagram. And so there's two hands there, making a heart, and Christ is in the center. And look at all these qualities, helpful, welcome, dignity, uh, friendly, peace, uh, empathy, gracious and so on. These are things that I'd like to think characterise our fellowship and every Christian fellowship. The church is a haven of hospitality. So to conclude, some challenges as uh, we reflect on this theme. Um, what's going well when it comes to hospitality in our lives? What things could possibly improve? What about the quality of hospitality and helps in our church fellowships? Could we in this coming week or next couple of weeks show a random act of kindness to somebody whom we know needs some kindness? 
you know, a random act is can be a, a tremendous blessing when it's done with sensitivity and awareness particularly. I'm going to encourage people in our fellowship to take the church bulletin, which has lots of information and teaching notes and reflections, uh, and give it to a friend or a neighbour um, or a relative. It might be someone across the street or it could be sent to someone around the world. And just see what happens. It might just provoke some really worthwhile conversations and provide opportunities for real sharing, perhaps over food or in some other context, perhaps even just a cup of coffee. But you know, there's always opportunities to grow in hospitality. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope and pray that this message has been helpful to you as an individual and also provides some real, excuse the pun, food for thought in your fellowship. So thank you very much for listening and God bless.